is Islam innately misogynistic? The answer to that, unfortunately, is a clear cut yes. If someone wants to quote aspects of the Islamic discourse, aspects of the Islamic uh, jurisprudential tradition, and juxtapose it with the Western discourses, especially here we're talking about second wave feminism, and expect Islam to correspond with those, they'll be utterly and bitterly disappointed because clearly we believe our system is superior. Welcome to episode 140 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. This episode was intense, to say the least. It's an opposing views on Islam. I had Muhammad Hijab on one side, an author and philosopher interested in political philosophy and comparative religion, and I had the pleasure of speaking to Ayan Hirsi Ali, an author, scholar, and former politician best known for her activism against women's treatment in Islam. I'm incredibly honored to be able to host these kind of conversations and to be able to speak to two sides of contentious subjects. I'm never happy when one side goes after the other side and attacks them personally rather than attacking their ideas. I left this opposing views kind of freaked out and fairly aggravated, to be honest, but I haven't edited anything because I think it's best to show what and how everyone said things, regardless of how uncomfortable it was. If you enjoy this content or learn something, please consider subscribing. Before we jump into a somewhat stressful podcast, this episode was brought to you by NordVPN. NordVPN is the fastest VPN in the world. Maybe you already knew that, but there's more. NordVPN helps protect you against all sorts of things. For example, bandwidth throttling from internet providers who will slow down your internet towards the end of your contract, hoping to force an upgrade. Did you know that they can do that? Nasty, but true. NordVPN encrypts your data and you can get content from anywhere in the world with it. They're without a doubt the best VPN in the game and I've been using VPNs since forever because Canadian Netflix sucks. Now I'm in land of the free, thank goodness, but I still use a VPN. They have a new exclusive offer for my listeners. Grab your NordVPN deal today over at nordvpn.com slash TMPP or use promo code TMPP the podcast acronym, for a huge discount off their premium plans, an extra free month, and a secret bonus gift, all with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Enjoy the episode. Ayan, thank you very much for joining me on my podcast. Michaela, thank you very much for having me. We've been trying to do this for a long time. I'm glad that we're finally doing it. I'm, I'm so glad. This is going to be very, very interesting. So I'm happy about it. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. So we're doing, we're doing a podcast on Islam today. And I have a number of questions. So I'm just going to get right into it. If that, Actually, no. Let's start off with if anyone who doesn't know who you are, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? So my name is Ayan Hirsi Ali. I was born in Somalia and I lived in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Ethiopia, in Kenya. And when I was 22 years old, I went to the Netherlands. And I think I'm famous or infamous for leaving Islam and uh, having lived in uh, these African and Middle Eastern countries after I arrived in the Netherlands, um, having made a journey that's not just geographical, not just physical, but intellectual. And so when I got acquainted with the norms and values of the West, such as freedom, equality, the rule of law, uh, women's rights, um, I thought that those values and those principles were superior to the ones that I was raised in. Uh, I was raised within the culture of Islam and in a tribal society. And so uh, I would say in a nutshell, that's my story. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to start off with, with um, what, what was your experience? And this is kind of a broad question, but what it, was your experience with Islam like? Well, in the early years, before I was 20 years old, I would say um, it was mundane. We were not extremely religious. 
uh, we identified ourselves as Muslims, prayed five times a day when we could and all that. But uh, we didn't really have the fundamentalist fanatical strains that we see later. When in the 1980s, when I was a teenager, there were teachers who came to our schools and our neighborhoods who were propagating this radical strain. And um, I joined them, I, I fell for it. What attracted me, I think, was just the, um, the clarity that they offered. You know, you've got a whole list of, here are the things that are forbidden in Islam, here are the things that are permitted, and all you have to do is just abide by these rules and you're a good person. Um, and then once I started actually uh, trying to abide by those rules, I found out how extremely difficult it was. And then later on in my life, when I came to the Netherlands and I saw people who are actually good people, honest people, people who tell the truth and who do things in ways that are very productive in their relationships with other human beings and within the world, that's when I started to reflect on Islam, both in the sense that I was raised where it, we were passive Muslims, and later on, when we became, I became an active, fanatical believer. Okay. Um, were the people you were seeing in the Netherlands, were these other religious people, were like Christianity or, or atheist, agnostic, or just in general? Uh, many of them were Christian. So when I first arrived at the Asylum Seekers Center, most of the people who volunteered to help asylum seekers, refugees, uh, they did it through their churches, so they were Christians. And the Christianity that I saw that was practiced in the Netherlands was a very appealing Christianity. People were actually, um, I, th I thought, very generous, very tolerant. Uh, for instance, even though they volunteered to help us as non-Christians, they didn't demand that we convert to Christianity. They didn't preach their religion. They didn't impose on us in that way at all. Um, and, and I thought that was interesting because when uh, I started to become an active Muslim and abide by these rules of you know, the permitted and the forbidden and all that, and I, I really wanted to be a good Muslim. One of the things that our teachers were telling us was, you have to go and convert non-Muslims. And, uh, and I thought it was interesting when I came to the Netherlands that these Christians uh, were not imposing or preaching or proselytizing their faith. Uh, they believed that they were just doing good uh, for the sake of goodness itself. Mm. And, and, and so, but there were also agnostics, they were atheists. Uh, later on, as you know, I, I left the Asylum Seeker Center, I went to college, I found jobs and uh, I was surrounded uh, by the time I left 14 years later, by the time I left the Netherlands, I was surrounded more by agnostics and atheists than Christians. Okay. Interesting. Mohammed Hijab, welcome to my podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. This should be an interesting episode. Um, before we get started, can you give anyone who doesn't know who you are a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? All right. So uh, my name is Mohammed Hijab. Um, much like yourself, I'm a, I'm a YouTuber. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Sapiens Institute. My academic background is in politics and um, history, where I've acquired a postgraduate in that as well. Uh, Islamic studies, of course, which I've acquired, acquired a postgraduate in as well, in addition to um, applied theology. Um, and um, currently doing my, my PhD in the philosophy of religion. And I have to say, uh, Michaela from the I'll say here that unlike the co-guest, the ultra-crepidarian academic charlatan uh, co-guest that you have, the obsequious um, apple polisher for the far right, Ian McGann, which is actually her real name, I'm actually qualified to speak about that, which we'll be speaking about today. Okay. It's quite an intro. Let's get started. I'm going to be asking you the same questions. Okay. Um, so first, what's your experience with Islam been like? I know that's kind of vague, but go for it. Yeah, I mean, f for me, obviously, Islam is everything in the sense that it defines how my purpose of life. My purpose of life is to worship one God, uh, submit my will to one God who is the creator of the universe. 
I um, wake up in the morning uh, thinking of that, go to sleep thinking of that. Um, it gives me anchorage, Michaela. It gives me moral uh, and existential anchorage. It allows me to live my life in a way which is meaningful and purposeful. Uh, there's a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad where he said, wondrous is the affair of the believer, that all of his affair is good, and that is not the case for anyone except for the believer. And that if something good happens to him, he is patient. And if something bad happens to him, he is patient and he is thankful and patient. So in other words, for me, I think in terms of my own kind of personal life, what it does is it makes meaning out of pain because life is full of pain, Michaela, as we all know, it's something that we cannot avoid. And I think having a framework, a religious framework, where the, the center is or the central aspect of it is to worship one God, that there's an eschatological dimension, um, that we believe in one God worthy of worship, not a man, not you know the creation, but one God. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the Old, you know, the Old Testament prophets and so on. It does give me uh, that stability that I think is uh, priceless. Um, and I have to say that um, I, I can't imagine really a life without it. You know, uh, so in, in, t in a nutshell, really, what Islam is for me is, is something which not only gives me meaning and purpose, but that if it was, if it was not part of my life, I couldn't imagine uh, what kind of depressed, a perpetually depressed state I would be in. Okay, um, so this is actually, this isn't the question I asked Ayan, because uh, I don't think it was as relevant, but w is there a reason that um, you, I wouldn't say chose necessarily, but you're practicing, you're practicing Muslim as opposed to a Christian or another religion that worships one God? Well, look, first and foremost, we would object, object to the fact that Christianity worships one God. Christi Christianity, both Catholicism and Protestantism, believe in the, the doctrine of the Trinity. They believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That the Father is God, the Son is God, and the, the Holy Spirit is God. But that there are not three gods, but one God. And we say that that is an unintelligible proposition. That's something that flies right in the face of reason, which is not possible logically. And that it's inconceivable, it's unintelligible, and it's unpardonable to believe that any man with a date of birth can be called God. And so Jesus Christ for us as Muslims is the Messiah. He is a prophet sent with wonders and miracles and signs, as the Bible correctly says in this point. But we cannot believe and we do not believe that Jesus Christ is God or the Son of God. We believe that Jesus Christ was a mighty messenger sent from God Almighty and that he was a person who was one of the greatest people who ever lived on this earth. We believe in from that perspective, we're Christians because we follow Christ. But we don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. And in addition, I would say we believe the final prophet, Muhammad, he had evidences that indicates the truth and the veracity of his prophethood. And for that reason, I, I, to be honest with you, I do believe it's a choice that everyone does have to make. And this is the reason why I am a Muslim, because it's just instinctively, it speaks to me that you have to worship one God, where the, you know, the, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that no creation can be God. And this is the, the, the dividing line or the fundamental difference between Muslims and Christians. Okay, thank you. In, in your experience, <clears throat> has, is, is Islam innately misogynistic? The answer to that, unfortunately, is a clear cut yes. Okay. Islam is misogynistic in its approach to women. I know that by saying this, I uh, offend a lot of people. I know that people's feelings get hurt, the feelings of Muslims. I know that that is the case. But setting feelings aside and just looking objectively at what it is um, that Islam says about women and where it positions us, the answer is yes, it is misogynistic. And I'll give you a few examples. That would be good, yeah. And I think the best example, because it's so factual, is the law, Sharia law, Islamic law. Islamic law declares that a woman has to have a male guardian at all times. That's not required of males. In Sharia law, a man is permitted to have four wives. She's not permitted to have four husbands. In Islamic law, in Sharia law, a woman's testimony in court is worth half 
of that of a man. It's not the other way around. Um, a sister inherits half of what her brother inherits. Wow. And this goes on and on. And I think to be, because these basic tenets of law, Sharia law, when they're implemented and where they're implemented, you see a huge difference between the way men and women are treated, girls and boys are treated. And I would say that is misogyny. And because I'm not, I'm not that familiar with um, Islam, is Sharia law something that's in the Quran directly? Sharia law is derived from the Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad is the founder of Islam, and his legacy is a body of law and norms um, that are implemented where there is a theocracy like Saudi Arabia or Iran or any of the other societies that try to establish um, legal systems that are based on Islam. Um, okay. So another example on the misogyny side is women are expected to cover their bodies. And there is some kind of discussion on how much of that. In some cases, they let you show the face and the hands. And in extreme cases, you have to be covered from head to toe, um, confined to the house. Um, your male guardian uh, chooses, or at least you need his endorsement to marry someone else. And all of this is in, uh, based in Sharia law. If you're a woman and you're not happy in a marriage, it's almost difficult, almost impossible to divorce your husband. Uh, and the other way around, for a man to divorce his wife, all he has to say is declare in front of two witnesses three times that he divorces his wife and that's done. So on the question, is Islam misogynistic? I think these facts speak for themselves. Uh, is Islam inherently misogynistic? Well, first and foremost, of course, there are misogyny needs to be defined because if it's defined definitionally as it is in the kind of dictionary, the hatred of women, then the answer is very clearly no, because the Quran very clearly states in more than one verse, you know, in chapter three, verse 195, in the that God does not let to waste any action of any doer among you, men or women, and that both of you are from one another. That uh, in chapter 33, verse 35, uh, the, the believing men and the believing women and the, you know, and so on. And it mentions a, a list of attributes mentioning men and women specifically, and then says that God has prepared for them a reward. And in fact, the Quran explicitly mentions that we cannot have hatred towards any believer because it's mentioned in chapter 59 of the Quran, God, do not put any hatred to the believers in our hearts. And that, of course, includes women as well. So from that perspective, it's impossible to postulate. It is impossible to postulate that Islam is misogynistic from that definitional perspective. But what we will say is, of course, misogyny is a label that is used haphazardly and arbitrarily between people in the West, in discourses, to mean different things. So, of course, neoconservatives or people that are more right-wing or alt-right are excuse, accuse themselves of being misogynistic to, uh, uh, by um, third-wave feminists and so on. And so it really depends on who is the one making the claim and what the robust definition that they have of misogyny is. And sometimes that can be ideologically um, uh, kind of inspired in the case of third-wave feminists I would say it certainly is. That's why, unfortunately, uh, even your father has been uh, accused of misogyny. I mean, people in, in, in the West, uh, credible intellectuals and academics have been accused of misogyny just because they believe in a traditional uh, a value, uh, uh, traditional values of a family system, a complementarian family system. And uh, for this reason, they're accused of misogyny. So, but one has to say this, and I think this is very important, Michaela. That we believe that there is an equality of value between men and women. We do believe that there is an equality of value between men and women. The Prophet himself, Muhammad, he said, that certainly men are equal to women in front of the law. That is the general rule. That is a statement of the Prophet Muhammad. However, we do believe in exceptions and we don't believe that equality of value means identicality in roles. And so, of course, people that are detractors from the other side like the academic charlatan, Ian McGann, who actually means 
refugee in the Somali language, of course, an ironic reminder to herself, she would say that Islam is misogynistic because of practices such as polygyny, of, which means that a man can marry more than one wife. And that is a practice that Muslims believe in. Or practices such as that Muslim men can marry Christian and Jewish women. And of course, that is something that Muslim women cannot do in Islam as well. And various other inheritance things or uh, aspects where there is a differential there between how men are treated to women. But we will say that equality of value does not mean identicality in roles. Let me say that one more time. Equality of value, we believe, does not mean identicality in roles. And therefore, just like Aristotle said, that like things should be treated like likewise, and that different things should be treated the same. We do believe that women have a collective female temperament on certain aspects, which need to be tailored for in legislation, which need to be tailored for in social and political life. And so therefore, if someone wants to use second wave, feministic, collectivistic discourses to try and attack the Islamic narrative, then they must first establish the truthfulness and the objective, the objectiveness of second wave feministic discourses. I and her see the feminists. We are opposed to feminism when we say that feminism has now almost certainly been cracked open as a false ideology. Of course, I think what well, I think I should add to this, in addition to all that was aforementioned, that Ayan McGann herself was embroiled in the most embarrassing of public inquiries, if you can call that that, whereby she herself was in a polygynous relationship. She was a mistress. She was a mistress to Niall Ferguson, her, her husband now. And she was doing so at the dismay of Sue Douglas, who is his ex-wife. And with the destabilizing effect, of course, the destabilizing effect to his family, to Lachlan Ferguson, to Phoenix Ferguson, the children of Niall Ferguson. So she attacks polygyny in her books, but she practices it in her daily life. And so this is a serious hypocrisy, not just in that which she does, McGann, Ian McGann, but in that which she states as well. So the, the challenge really is, and I will repeat this, if someone wants to quote aspects of the Islamic discourse, aspects of the Islamic uh, jurisprudential tradition and juxtapose it with the Western discourses, especially here we're talking about second wave feminism, and expect Islam to correspond with those, they'll be utterly and bitterly disappointed because clearly we believe our system is superior. We believe the system is failing. We believe that uh, uh, nuclear households are being destroyed in the West. We believe that you've got it wrong. We believe that we've got it right. And so in order to defeat us in argument, you must first argue from first principles. And so, yes, we do have differences with Western, especially second wave or third wave feministic discourses, but that does not, that does in no way sh uh, show or indicate that Islam is misogynistic. To the contrary, and one last thing I will say is McGann herself is blissfully ignorant. I and McGann, I and Hersey McGann, blissfully ignorant of the Islamic tradition, the underqualified, overconfident, ultra-crepidarian, academic charlatan, right-wing, apple polish-up, obsequious woman that she is, doesn't <laughs> even know that, in, in, it doesn't even know the basics of the Islamic tradition, mentions in her book, Heretic, in page 77, that we worship Muhammad. She doesn't even know the basics of the religion. She makes squandering mistakes, one after the other, about gender in jurisprudence in Islam in her latest book, uh, Pray, you can see it in uh, page 151, where she may, may, makes a series of uh, unsubstantiated claims about Muslim women uh, and their rights in Islam, saying that their rights can be sold to strangers and all kinds of nonsense propositions which have no basis in the religion of Islam. So if you really want to know about women's rights in Islam, one has to go to the source. And this ultra-crepidarian academic charlatan, uh, Ayan, is, is, is just a failure. Who's, who's been uh, embro has been let in by the most unusual types of affirmative action program to the neoconservative circles because she has no academic uh, acumen at all. Okay, okay. So I'd, I'd like to just keep the rest of the conversation if we can try to attack the idea rather than the person. Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to have any guests on this show again okay. for opposing views. Okay, okay. Um, I have one follow-up question about what you just said, because 
I think I understand a, a bit, but um, you talked about you talked about that in regards to believers. So what about non-believers? Like how does the kind of, and, and I'll just be straight up with it. How does the potential misogyny of affect women if they're non-believers or men's relationships, Muslim men's relationships with non-believing women? Muslim, Muslim men's relationship with non-believing women there is no differential in that as compared to Muslim men's relationship with believing or non-believing men. There's nothing in the Quran or in the Sunnah or in the prophetic tradition that indicates that there should be any different way as a general to how men treat non-Muslim women to men, except for those things which are outlawed by Islam itself. For example, having intercourse before marriage or um, being alone in a place with a woman Now that can be a Muslim woman or a Muslim Or a non-Muslim woman These are things Islam prohibits Because it creates instability in families It creates instability in societies and so on The, 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 the thesis And I'm not sure if you want to ask this as a separate question But the thesis that McGann has put forward In her newest book, Pray Is that actually what you find is that Muslim men, the immigration of Muslim men to European countries has increased rape. This is basically it. And she mentions in page 33 of that book, she says there's an actual causal relationship. She says that there's a causal relationship. I've read her book, the entire book. And I've seen the data that she puts forward for the claims that she makes, Michaela. And she, and just go for the idea. The idea is that Muslim men immigration coming into European countries causes an increase in rape. That's what she is mm -hmm. saying. Now, look, she mentions, what is the data that she mentioned? She mentions data from about five European countries, including but not limited to the United Kingdom, France, and Sweden. Now, what she then states is that there's evidence for a causal relationship in page 33. What is this data missing? Michaela, this data is missing I mean, this data has everything going for it, in fact, except for the evidence. Because this data does not even have that these men are Muslim men. And that might be a surprise and a shock to you. But this data is about where these men come from. So, for instance, she cites that these men come from Africa, from uh, subcontinental Asia. But you will know, and I'm sure your viewers who are clever people, who have been educated at a minor level, will know that Africa is not, a, is not a Muslim continent. The entire continent of Africa, there are many Muslims in it, and there are many Christians in it. So the data is not conclusive. In fact, it doesn't even show anything. It just shows that people coming from Africa, there's an increase of people coming from Africa, and then there's an, uh, an increase also in rape. Okay, well, we tried the same methodology, Michaela. I actually tried the same methodology with Latin America and America, the United States of America. So people coming from Latin America, which are not Muslims, as you know, and when they go into America, the United States, there is also a correlative increase in rape. Now, we can't say just because there's a correlative increase in rape, and this is a fallacy, by the way, that therefore the causation is those people. But even if we did say that, well, Latin Americans are not Muslim. Latin Americans are Christians. And therefore, the most part, very small Muslim minority, very, very small and negligible Muslim minority. And therefore, the whole thesis collapses. She even mentions, and she lies through omission by mentioning data from the World Health Organization. And she is a liar, by the way. She's a liar. She lied to the Dutch parliament. She lies by, by omission by mentioning the WHO, the only I know, the only data that has uh, the, that the WHO has done on rape. And she, she mentioned certain things about Africa, once again, it's not even a Muslim continent in its entirety, and subcontinental Asia. But what she doesn't mention is that according to the WHO, that same report that she mentions, but she omits this part, according to the WHO, that stranger rape is highest in what they call the high income areas, which is the West. So in other words, stranger rape is highest in Europe, or if you want to generalize, Europe and America and Canada, where you're from. So, so wait a minute, what's going on here? The whole thesis starts to be destroyed. And of course, as I've said to you before, and I'll say to you again, Islam prohibits premarital, premarital 
uh, engagements between men and women. How on earth can you get a thesis that says Islam, and she mentions the word cause, and it's a fallacy, causes an increase in rape for Muslim men to non-Muslim women, where Islam limits it to the highest level. Stranger rape, funny enough, according to the WHO, is lowest in areas which are most populated by Muslim people, like the subcontinental area. And of course, they say that's because of the cultural reasons of a woman coming out and all that kind of thing. That's their analysis, but that's not their data. More, uh, furthermore, if it was to do with the jurisprudence, then we know that Orthodox Jews have a very similar, if not more strict, way more strict, kind of jurisprudential tradition when it comes to the interaction of men and women. However, I will tell you, Michaela, despite that being the case, we don't see that that is causing any rape within Jewish communities or Jewish men doing that to non-Jewish women. She mentions in her one of her interviews that she does, she says that therefore Muslim people need to be made uh, be taught how to be egalitarian. We believe in a complementarian system where there's a managerial hierarchy and the man's at the head of it. We do believe in that, Michaela. We're not going to lie to you. In the households, that's we, we believe that's the only way we can do it. However. She's saying, no, let's, she's trying to impose a feminist narrative, which you should be opposed to and your father is already opposed to, which she says that she's trying to, uh, that men that are coming in from uh, abroad should now be uh, kind of vetted by, told, by being told what? By being told that they need to believe in the egalitarian uh, family system. Now, if that's the case, that's not going to happen with just Muslims. That should also happen with Christians, with traditional conservative values, and it can happen with Jews as well. And if that's the case now, she's ex this is a kind of corrosive uh, restriction on, on human freedom, which is unusual. It's a creeping in of collectivist discourse. And it's very unusual because in other places, she denies that she's a collectivist. In summary, therefore, I will say that the thesis is most pathetic and it's, it's, it is most uh, rejected. It, I, it cannot be, and it has already been refuted, by the way, by many, many academics. But it, for example, Jill uh, uh, Filipovich, who's recently written a a comprehensive refutation of this nonsense that this miserable specimen of an academic charlatan has written forward and for some reason is being uh, uh, is being taken seriously by people but it cannot be taken seriously by people this is basically let me show you something uh, michaela since we're on the topic it's basically a rehashing of uh, it's the rehashing of the jewish discourses as you can see here, the fascistic Jewish, the Jewish problem. You see the white woman there and then the Jewish man. Can you see this kind of thing? Can you see it? I'm not sure if you can see that. This is the kind of thing before. Uh, can, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. A little what bit closer would probably be better. Can you put that a bit closer, please? But, but this is the kind of newspaper article where the Jewish problem, the white woman, there's the prize and all the people, the Jewish man there. Bring it back a bit. Bring it back. Bring it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you see it? Wait. Just tilt it forward a bit. Like that. Can you see it? There's a yeah, white woman there and a Jewish man on the side. This is before what happened, the pogroms and whatever happened. This is the discourse. She's just, uh, she's just rehashing a, fa a fascistic discourse. And being academics and clever people, we should, be, you know, I'm sure people in the neoconservative movement or the alt-right or whoever it is in America and in the West will be able to see this for what it is. It's nonsense. It's academically redundant. And it is the most ridiculous thesis I've ever seen in my life by someone who has no peer reviewed work and should not be taken seriously by anybody. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see. We got to one of the questions I was going to, so we, you addressed one of the questions, so I'll skip that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but so let me go, hmm, do I want to follow up instead? Yeah. Okay. Let me follow up and then we'll get to the rest of the questions. Okay. So this is what I've learned and I don't know whether it's true or not, because I don't know what's true exactly out there with all the misinformation about everything. Um, but this is what I've heard that concerns me. And it's that, and, and this argument I think makes sense. It's that when there's an influx of Muslim people to certain European countries and culture starts changing in those areas, um, things like, is like, for instance, is this true in Islam that women who are supposed to have a guardian, a male guardian? Is that your question? Yeah. Is that true? Just so for, I know to continue purpose, my question. Like, so there is something called a welly uh, in Islam. The welly is a male guardian in certain very restricted contexts. So for example, if a woman travels and it's a long distance, 
Some scholars say she doesn't need anybody to accompany her. Some scholars say that she should, she should have someone accompanying her. If you were to travel, Michaela, I'm sorry to put it to you, but someone like yourself, and you had a security guard with you, okay, I don't think that's that diminishes from your independence or your volitional uh, acumen or who you are as a person. I think they're just it's a good precaution to have. So it's a right that a Muslim woman has rather than something which diminishes her value. Why? Because... You know, people who are important require uh, protection. And for us, we believe that Muslim women are very important. So in that kind of context, and in the context of marriage, for example, if a Muslim woman wanted to get married, some scholars say, the majority of them say, that the, 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 the guardian should get involved in the process. I should also add that some say she, they don't. So there, there's a difference of opinion here. But these are the two, from my mind, the two restricted contexts which guardianship applies. Apart from that, no. Okay. Okay. Good. That answers part of it. Then the next one would be like, why is it that in some areas um, women are required to like completely cover their bodies or in some areas it's, you know, their faces are, are open. Um, what's the difference there? And what does that have to do with the actual, well, religion? I think this is a view of the religion. It's a minority view, but nevertheless, it's a very robust view, uh, which is that women should be covered and the majority view that majority of women in the Muslim world believe is that the hands and the face should be, uh, should be, can be allowed to be seen, but the rest of it should be covered. Some say, no, actually, everything should be covered. And these two views are two views that Muslim people have held for 1,400 years. Now, it depends on what view the woman holds, what she decides to do. You'll find quite interesting that the very small minority of women that do that and I'm not saying that as a matter of they're doing something wrong. In fact, I'm, I think I, I praise what they do. But those women who do what they do, they do it from their own volition. Now, I don't, very rarely, from what I've seen, have I seen people being forced to put a niqab on, which is the face covering. I mean, I have seen people be pressured to put on a hijab on, but not very rarely have I seen a niqab. The idea really is that women, uh, there's a physiological difference between men and women, a sexual difference between men and women, such that there should be certain uh, pre precautions that are put in place so that uh, distractions to an otherwise cognitively healthy environment are limited. And that's why you have boys' schools and girls' schools in the West. They understand this. They understand that having boys in one place and girls in one place, sometimes it limits the distraction. We, we just extend that. And there's nothing to say that, well, having boys and girls schools, for example, is something that should be done and, uh, and that is something that shouldn't be done. What we will say in addition to that is, in fact, most psychological research, in, in, including but not limited to Baumeister, uh, I think is 2001, and uh, uh, Kathleen, who's actually a woman as well. They say that in terms of sexual difference between men and women, that men's sex drive is completely different in terms of it's, it's more frequent. They say in the abstract, it's more frequent, it's more pressing, it's more uh, severe mm -hmm. and so on than women. So we do realize these realities and, and our religion, uh, it caters for those realities that m men find women immediately more sexually attractive than what men find, uh, women find. This is something which is pretty much uh, accepted within the psychological community in the academic works. And so therefore to avoid uh, all kinds of sexual uh, violence, number one, they in the Quran mentions this, so that they don't get sexually molested or anything like that, and or to also avoid distraction from the purpose of life, which is to worship one God, the co covering is mandated upon Muslim women. Now, as I say, covering the face is something which some scholars of Islam uh, believe in, and so, uh, some say, no, actually covering the face is not something uh, that is required at all, and this is the vast majority of women accept this uh, and practice this but in a nutshell it's because men i know this sounds like a very basic answer men are different to women and women are different to men and those differences are respected those differences are respected and we have something else if you want to add if i want to add this as well in the islamic tradition something called ghira which which means a man's protective jealousy over a woman so for example if i you know if a muslim man married a a, a, a woman they should feel they should feel uncomfortable, okay, and this is the Islamic understanding, they should feel uncomfortable at the fact that other men are looking at her in a sexual manner. They should feel uncomfortable with that. Why? Because they should feel as if that's their job to satisfy sexually and otherwise that woman. And so 
for other men to be feasting on another woman like that is something we 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 feel is um, contrary to the disposition of a man and something which actually creates problems later down the line because well the woman is going to uh, do certain things and the man's going to do certain things in the family and it's going to cause these uh, unstable families really and so this is a way by which and through which stabilities of families can be maintained and that the muslim people can keep their honor and in addition to keeping away from distractions which will otherwise impede uh, judgments uh, as something which is not far away from the western understanding but it's, it's extended so the western understanding we do have girls schools boys schools girls locker rooms girls uh, boys locker rooms etc etc who says it should stop there it's very arbitrary kind of morality to be honest with you we say no it should also be extended to these other areas and we believe that god the all-knowing all-wise one is the one who laid those foundations down and if you don't believe in islam and the quran i understand why someone will not go with that but if we do believe that this this book was from god it makes perfect sense Okay. Thank you. That was interesting. That's a good response. Okay. I have one point for devil's advocate, and then I have to get on to the next question, but is it possible that when, um, and I'm not saying this for all Islamic men or Muslim men, but is it possible um, that if men grow up learning what you just said, and they go to countries where women aren't covered and the reason women are covered in their country is to avoid sexual violence, is it possible that that could increase the tendency towards sexual violence for women who aren't covered? I will have to say uh, it is possible because I can't tell you it's not possible. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can only say that it's uh, hypothetically possible, but in order for that to be uh, substantiated, it has to be sociologically verified. And uh, I can't say to you it's not possible because that's the work of sociologists and psychologists. Uh, unfortunately, the, as I say, it's a good idea, it has everything going for it, except for the evidence. If people want to affirm such a thesis, they have to go for a, a more plausible um, theoretical model with a proper methodology, and which is peer-reviewed. Unfortunately, Ian McGann has done none of those things or any of those things. And until those things are done, and it becomes something which is commonly understood in psychological and sociological literature, we have to remain at least agnostic to this pro proposition. At this moment, we have no evidence for it. Okay. This episode is brought to you by Schwank Grills. Schwank Grills are portable, American-made infrared grills that get you steakhouse-level taste in about four minutes. The steaks can come out crispy on the outside, but juicy, medium-rare on the inside if that's what you like. Mired reactions for the win. Also, I haven't really told anybody this online, but did you know I like my steaks medium well? I want that meat crunchy. These grills don't smoke, they're easy to clean, and even come with a pizza stone. I do not recommend eating pizza ever, but if you're going to do it, you might as well do it in the Schwank grill. Cooking lamb chops though, perfection. I would choose these guys over a barbecue any day, hands down. Right now, there's a special offer over at schwankgrills.com. Just use promo code MP at checkout for $150 off their grill and grill cover, but only with code MP. That's schwankgrills.com, code MP for $150 off. It is a sweet deal, especially if you suck at cooking meat. You won't suck anymore with these guys. Do you think that there's a link between Muslim immigration in Europe and an increase in sexual violence towards European women? Um, the answer to that is yes. And there are some caveats. I've, my latest book is called Pray. Um, and the subtitle is Islam, Immigration and the Erosion of the Rights of Women. Um, the answer, uh, uh, my uneasy answer to this is yes. The caveat is not all Muslim men are misogynists and not all Muslim men harass or attack women or treat them badly. Um, but there is a minority and that minority is considerable. And that minority of very young Muslim men have come from societies where women are viewed differently from the way they are viewed in Europe. And once they come to Europe, they start to behave in ways that are hostile to women, sexual harassment, rapes, gang rapes, um, even syndicates or grooming gangs that prey on young girls. Now, what has Islam got to do with any of this? When you talk to 
religious leaders, Muslim religious leaders, what they say is, well, the behavior of these men is wrong, but the fact that women are around in public, uncovered and by themselves is also wrong. So then they propose solutions that are Sharia based in Europe. That's one. Hmm. Number two, women are divided into those who are good and modest and those who are bad. And bad women, whether it is within Islam or within the tribal culture that some of these young men come from, women who are regarded as bad are regarded as unprotected. Unprotected meaning unprotected by male guardians. So in Uh. that sense, what you see is, and, and I have talked to some of these young men, Muslim men in Europe and asked them, why is it that you can't, if if you behave this way in Egypt, when you come to Germany, why do you carry on behaving this way? And a a lot of them who've actually done some reflection on the differences in societies, just say, they they explain the differences and they say, if I behave this way in Egypt or in Afghanistan or in Iraq, I would meet with no disapproval the women who are targeted, they are the ones who are disapproved of because they are the ones who put themselves in trouble. And so as you can see, there's this big clash of values or clash of civilization. I don't know what you want to call it, but on the treatment of women, there definitely is a clash of values when it comes to the values of of Europe versus the values of Islam. That's very interesting. Okay, that makes sense. Do you think Islam is spreading, particularly over Europe? Uh, The answer to that now is yes and no. It is spreading through immigration. Of course, a large number of Muslims in Muslim countries are leaving their societies and moving to non-Muslim societies. And I think Europe is in proximity. So in that sense, Europe is becoming Islamized if you will, uh, or there are more Muslim people, more Muslims who are living in Europe. Um, But there's also been a huge effort ever since Islam was founded of proselytizing, of uh, trying to get non-Muslim societies to adopt Islam, either through persuasion or through force or through both of those means. And so in that sense, it's also spreading. There's a lot more campaigning for people to join Islam than the other way around. The reason why I hesitated when you posed Mm. the question is that I'm also seeing a lot of young people today who are leaving Islam. And that's a very interesting phenomenon. And uh, in my view, it's not talked about enough. Hmm. And why do you think that's happening? I think a number of reasons. First of all, we've seen in the late 20th century, early 21st century, the uh, efforts of the radical Islamists to use violence to take power in Muslim societies and to spread it through violence. Uh, You remember outfits like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. um, And these organizations, I think, have disillusioned a lot of young Muslim people. They forced Muslims Mm. into a corner where they pose questions, they ask questions. Do we really agree with these things that we're seeing? We think about ISIS when they were beheading people and enslaving women. And they said, this is Sharia law. This is what we are trying to get uh, to accomplish. And a lot of Muslims were put off by that. And some of those who went ahead to question Uh, whether this was truly Islamic or not, many of them were left feeling uh, that they couldn't defend some of these actions and they realized many of these were founded within the faith. So I think there's a lot of disappointment. There's also, of course, modernity. Young people with online social media, even though they may be in Muslim societies or in Muslim households, they are exposed to the modern world, I think in ways that past generations were not. That's having huge impacts on uh, young Muslim people as well. And I think it takes them to a place of at least agnosticism, if not outright atheism. Okay, that makes sense. Is Islam slowly taking over Europe? 
Well, here, here's the thing, uh, Michaela. Islam has always been part of Europe. We have to see that, first of all, the Renaissance, according to almost every historian of science um, that spoke, spoke about this issue, like, for example, Patricia Farah and uh, David Lindbergh. But in addition to even Orientalists like Thomas uh, Arnold, who, who wrote The Preaching of Islam, he's an Orientalist. And all those people see that actually the Islamic influence has caused, the, or was a trigger at least, to the Renaissance. And not only that, I mean, you have to remember something like this computer that we're looking at each other with right now. And this, I mean, a lot of that was the influence of Islamic science. For example, Ibn al-Haytham, who, whose theory on optics was carried over to the West and therefore through it, we could develop things like cameras. So there is an influence of Islam and always has been an influence of, on, um, of Islam onto Europe. And sometimes, and most of the time, I would say, that's a positive influence. Now, there are countries in Europe, as you know, countries like Bosnia and Kosovo and Albania and provinces like Dagestan and Chechnya, which are Muslim majority provinces. Uh, but despite all of this, Michaela, according to Pew, there's only 5% of people in Europe that are Muslim. Only 5%. There are, in my country where I'm originally from, Egypt, there are 10% of Christians in Egypt. There's more Christians in Egypt, a Muslim majority country, one of the biggest Muslim majority countries, than there are Muslims in Europe. We, we, so there is nothing spectacular or unremarkable about the fact that there's a Muslim minority in Europe. The subversion narrative that Ian McGann and others like her are attempting to put forward in, in, uh, in order to acquiesce and to placate to their uh, masters in the most servile and most embarrassing, degrading of ways is something we've already seen in Europe with the Jewish problem that was so called in the 1930s. They refer to it as the Jewish problem. The Nazis who there, uh, thereafter burned six million innocent Jews alive. I'll show you another picture and hopefully this can be shown in clearer detail. Look at this a picture here. I'm not sure. Can you see this? And we're bringing it closer. This is a picture yeah, once again. Yeah, tilt it. Yes, yeah, so we'll tilt it. It's in a Jewish newspaper. Bring it down. Down a bit more. Tilt it forward. Yeah, can you see it? Oh, there. It's rats, rats, okay? Now, these rats in the Jewish newspaper were meant to symbolize Jewish people. This is the time where it was the Jewish problem. Now we're seeing the same exact terminology used. Ian McGann, who I may add, inspired Anders Breivik, one of the most monstrous of terrorists in the last hundred years. He quotes her by name in his manifesto, by name in his manifesto. This man, uh, who is a Nazi, basically, and he does the salute. You might have heard of him. Killed 77 liberal non-Muslim people. Okay. It was inspired and influenced by Ian McGann, Ian Hersey, a terrorist in influencer she is. He was, he was looking at the same literature that people like those who, who would do... Uh, caricatures like this of Jewish people we're doing. And this is the same exact language we're seeing now. Instead of the Jewish problem, Michaela, we're seeing the Muslim problem. We have to be able to see this. We have to be able to recognize this. So this subversion narrative that uh, you Muslims are taking over Europe, although there are Muslim majority European countries, Turkey is one of the biggest Muslim countries in the world. And half of it is, Mus uh, half of it is actually in Europe, is, is physically in Europe. Istanbul is in Europe. It's one of the biggest cities in Europe. It's a Muslim majority country what we're talking about when we say uh, taking over europe so it's, it's it's a nonsense narrative that is put forward by fascistic people apple polishers for the right wing uh, like uh, mcgann ian mcgann which now needs to be called out because it's becoming embarrassing for everybody else okay is islam the world's fastest growing religion uh it was and in some areas, it may still be. Uh, but right now, I would say, just given the sheer number of Muslims who are either adopting other religions or adopting an agnostic position or becoming atheists, uh, I am not sure it is the world's fastest growing religion. Now, in terms of you know, religious campaigning, uh, uh, individuals and groups going out to convert people or to keep people within the fold of Islam. I think that's one question 
on which the research has to be updated. But when it comes to birth, I think in that sense, in terms of fertility rates, then yes, Islam is definitely the fastest hmm. growing religion. Okay. Is Islam the world's fastest growing religion? Well, according to Pew Research, of course it is. And the reason for that is that it's largely to do with birth rates because Muslim women have more children than non-Muslim women pound for pound. Uh, and that is something that Islam actually encourages, quite frankly. Uh, polygyny is less of a reason because it's not widely practiced, although it could be said to be somewhat of a reason in places like Nigeria, uh, where it is practiced, and other parts of sub-Saharan Africa where, where it is practiced. Um, but there is a growing level of Muslim converts in the West, a huge number of Muslim converts in the West, people becoming Muslim from all parts of the world. And the reason why they're becoming Muslim from what we've seen, and we've worked with an organization that collect these data, uh, this kind of data, uh, is because they are convinced with the religion of Islam. They're disillusioned with Christianity. They see that Christianity has a slavish type of morality, as Nietzsche said, slap him on the one cheek and give him the other cheek. Uh, Nietzsche called it the slavish morality, but obviously that's a verse in the Bible, the New Testament. We don't believe in any of that. We believe that if someone slaps you in the cheek, you slap them back. We believe that also one God, we've, we've mentioned this. We believe in families. We've, we've stuck to our traditional values. Because it's a strong religion and solid, people have seen that it actually transforms their lives. And therefore, conversion is actually another reason why Islam is the fastest growing religion. And in fact, all of these reasons combined, according to Pew, uh, Pew Research, say that in 2100, that Islam will be the world's largest religion. Of course, another reason is that people are leaving Christianity in droves. In, in this country, the United Kingdom, where I'm from, in 2001, you know, we, we had about 75% Christian people in this country. And now 2021, although the census data has not been released, it's, it's probably going to be something like 40%. That's the projection of Christian. That's a, that's a deduction of tens of millions of Christian people in this country. Why? Because Christianity has not stood the test of time. Um, the narratives in Genesis, I remember even reading your dad's book, The Maps of Meaning, and he, he had some doubts about Christianity by just reading the Genesis narrative, because the Genesis narrative is very much out of touch with anything that could be considered scientific. And, and that's another reason, the Trinity, the, the slavish morality, the lack of structure in that religion, and so on and so, forth and so forth. So people are leaving Christianity, which is another reason why Islam is the fastest growing uh, religion. Do you mean slavish like um, forgiveness? No, uh, I don't. Well, this is a quote from Nietzsche. Nietzsche, uh, interestingly, and I put this on my Twitter, he actually had an interesting stance of Christianity. The fact that you get hit or attacked or uh, oppressed and that uh, you don't actually respond, this is almost verging on a pacifistic notion. This kind of thing is, we believe is, well, Nietzsche believed it was a slavish morality. It was slavish. It was like a slave. That's how a slave is treated. Whereas Islam, it doesn't say anything like that at all. It says that if you are dealt with in a certain way, you know, by the way, which is that the, that the recompense of a sin, so if someone is to harm you in a certain way, is that you harm them in exactly the same way. But whoever is forgiving, whoever is pardoning and forgiving, then there, the reward will be with God. But sometimes, Michaela, and you know this more than anyone else, and so does your father, sometimes kindness turns into weakness. And sometimes uh, forgiven, forgiveness is not forgiveness, especially when you do it with someone that will harm you again and harm others again. That's why we have prisons. That's why, we ha That's why Christianity actually had to act like Islam in order to expand, in order to be what it is. In other words, it had to have a just war theory. It had to have, it didn't have this morality. Theodosius II and Constantine and all of those uh, emperors of Rome didn't decide to be pacifists. They decided to expand their empires, which of course is something that Islam as well did, but it's something that is within the fiber of the Islamic tradition and something that Christians had to adopt despite the, uh, the teachings, at least the non-eschatological teachings of Jesus Christ in this world. So most, in order for Christians to get to where they are now or where they were before, they had to act in a way which was more in line with Islamic jurisprudence than it is with this what, what Nietzsche called the slavish morality of Christianity. Okay. Next question. In regards to Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS, 
Do you have a response to people who say, well, that's not what Islam is. Those are just like fanatics and they're not, they shouldn't be associated with each other. I do. And I think uh, what's become very clear to me over the years is there are a lot of really good people who are Muslim and who are uh, really virulently opposed to the actions of Al Qaeda and ISIS. The problem is that when leaders of Al Qaeda and ISIS, when they invoke the Quran or they invoke the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, those invocations are more consistent with their actions than the good Muslims who are saying, we reject violence, we reject force, we reject intolerance, and uh, we embrace freedom and equality. And so I think they, those good Muslims find themselves in a very difficult position. My friend Majid Nawaz, he says what we should do is we should make a distinction between Islam and Islamism. And mm. if we do that, that gives the good Muslim an opportunity to identify as a Muslim and take out of his faith that what, which he needs. And marginalize the radicals like the leaders and members of al-Qaeda and ISIS as Islamists, as fanatics mm -hmm. who uh, refuse to separate politics from religion and so on. And maybe that will work. Uh, but if you just ask me for, you know, just a factual observance, I'll say some of these leaders and their invocations are consistent with some of the basic scriptural uh, legacy of the prophet muhammad that's unfortunate but it's true okay isis and al-qaeda yeah now is that is that real islam yeah well isis and al-qaeda um well look at exactly what these people say let me give you the most uh, you know uh, prominent figure osama bin laden bruce lawrence in a book that was tracking all the things that Osama bin Laden states that in page 141, he states that Osama bin Laden, when asked about killing innocent people and that the Quran and the Hadith, the Quran and the Hadith prohibit that. And so how come you're doing it? He cited logical evidence of symmetrical warfare. He said, which literally is, he literally said it's something which is known by necessity. In other words, they're killing our innocents so we are killing their innocence. This is his reasoning. Ian McGann, who apparently became an apostate because she, Ian Hersey, but her real name is McGann, which means refugee in the Somali language, apparently who listened to Osama bin Laden and her, his jurisprudential readings before becoming an apostate of Islam. She said that she agreed with his, with, with his understanding of Islam, with his, with his reasoning. But Osama bin Laden himself admits, and this is in a book which can be read in the English language by Bruce Lawrence, is saying that this is not because of the religion of Islam. It's despite the religion of Islam that we're doing this. It's a logical argument that we're putting forward of symmetrical warfare. We are, we are killing them because they are, we are killing their civilians because we are killing, they are killing our civilians. This is what he is saying. But the Quran very clearly states, Michaela, in chapter 60, verse 8, that God does not uh, forbid you to feel justly with those who do not try and kill you because of your religion. Or try and kick you out of your homes. and That you're good with them and you're just with them. That's what the Quran says. That God loves the just people. In other words, Islam forbids the killing of innocent civilians. Categorically, the Prophet said, Man qatala mu'ahadan lam ahatal jannah. Whoever kills a non-combatant, non-believer, they will not smell the fragrance of heaven. When innocent people were killed at the time of the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad himself, he stated that this is something ana bari'u mimma fa'alahu khalid. He said, I am completely disassociated with this person Khalid did, which is killing innocent people. The Sahabi, who was a companion who was new to the religion of Islam, he didn't understand. He said, I'm completely disassociated with it. In other words, Islam is categorical about the killing of civilians, about the killing of innocent people, non-combatants and so on. Now it's a challenge to people like the hate peddlers, like Ian McGann, the hate peddlers, 
the individuals who are miserable specimens of academic charlatans that they are, who lie about the religion of Islam to challenge the references okay, that I've just okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what, what, is, it, is it possible that there... I mean, you're going to say yes, because like anything's possible. So I should reword that. Okay. Um, c- couldn't, couldn't people, okay. You specifically said it's against the Quran to hurt innocent people, Yes. but if they're believed to not be innocent, then they could possibly get hurt. And I mean, that goes across all religions, but non-combatants. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what do you think the primary differences are that you've seen between Islam and Christianity? The primary differences? Primary differences, yeah. Well, I think the the primary and probably the most well-known differences is Islam was founded um, by a man who uh, was, it was founded in a context uh, that was tribal, very parochial, very small. Um, and the man who founded Islam turned it into an empire. So Islam expanded through the use of force, mainly through the use of force in the early, in the early decades. Christianity was founded within an empire. And I think from then on, there was this distinction within Christianity, this, this separation of church and state or religion and the emperor's realm. And that separation of religion from politics in Christianity and the conflation of religion and politics in Islam that's an abiding difference. So that's one key difference. A second key difference is the figure of Jesus Christ, who uh, is not a lawgiver and is not seen, uh, he's seen as uh, God's son came uh, to the world to save uh, human beings from sin, and there's this, uh, I think I'm, I'm butchering it, but uh, you know, uh, when it comes to some of these religious punishments, the New Testament is a lot uh, milder, <laughs> uh, gentler uh, than the body of law, Sharia law that Islam has and the absolutes within Islam. Uh, so throw the fast stone, you know, cast the fast stone. He who has no sin, cast the fast stone. That's not part of Islam. <laughs> uh, so these are, I think, some very, very interesting differences and they lead to interesting outcomes. Yeah, very. What are the primary differences between Islam and Christianity? Islam believes in one God worthy of worship. Okay, this God is not a creature. This God is not a man. This God is not an animal. This God is not everywhere in the physical sense, such that we can put him in a jar or put him in the toilet or anything like that. He's not a monkey. He's not a cow. He's not in the cow, any of that stuff. It's We believe in a transcendent God that is perfect and that is worthy of worship. The all-knowing one, the all-wise one, the most merciful one. By the way, the loving one as well, al Wadud, The loving, we believe God is love. We do believe God is love. He is the loving one. We believe that he's the forgiving one, that we also have to be loving and forgiven, forgiving. But we also believe God is all just. We also believe that God is, uh, that he can exert punishment on the people. And so this is our conception of God. We believe in one God worthy of worship. And in addition to that, we do not believe in the Trinity. We don't believe in the Holy Ghost. That is also God, which is equivalent to the Father and the Son, which was a a development, by the way, a Roman development in the fourth century with the Cappadocian fathers. If you can read a book like R&D Kelly's book, it it, it outlines how the Trinity was developed. Almost consensus on this matter now that it was a Trinity, there's development in the Trinity in Rome. And they acquiesced to uh, other mythologies which they put into their religion, which is why you find the Trinity even exists. 
like Mithraism and other things. I'm not saying it's from exactly those things, but we have statements from Justin Martyr, like, for example, a church father who said that just like you believe in Jupiter, like the mythological God, we also believe in the father and the son. It's not a, it's not a coincidence, Michaela, that you find all of these father-son relationships between mythological gods. It's not a coincidence that you have Horus and Isis. Not the, other, not the group, but Horus and Isis, or that Mithra and his son, or Hercules and Zeus, or whatever it is. And then you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's no coincidence. The reason why you find that in Christianity is because it was clearly influenced by other mythologies that were there at the time. And so that's one thing. We don't believe in original sin, Michaela. We don't believe that we are born sinful. We believe in original goodness. Why would God? We, the Quran clearly states, well, that one soul shall not be given responsibility for what another soul has earned. So why should it be the case that if Adam uh, fell from the tree, uh, sorry, ate from the tree, that I now have the sin of that? We don't believe in any of that. We believe in individual responsibility for one's actions. You know, individual responsibility for one's actions. I'm not going to be held to account for what someone else did before me. So the, the doctrine of original sin, which is central to the Christian tradition, that we are fallen and that we have sin, we don't believe in that. We believe in original goodness, the fitra. In addition, we don't believe that God requires a blood sacrifice, Michaela. We don't believe that God requires a blood sacrifice in order for him to forgive us. That's exactly what the crucifixion is. He required a blood sacrifice to forgive us. We believe that God is forgiven for forgiving and that he can forgive us directly. He does not require a blood sacrifice. We also don't believe uh, that God can die, i.e. the resurrection, and that God can, because God is all living. Al-Hayul Qayyum. We believe that he's all living, never, never dies when he's dead. What was, what, who's, who's, who's holding up the heavens and the earth? Who's sustaining and maintaining the heavens and the earth? So we also believe in the Prophet Muhammad which is the final and uh, last prophet, which was required in order to fix these issues, which were then inserted into re the religion of Christianity, which we believe that Jesus, when he originally came, he came with the pure monotheism. He came with the pure monotheism, Michaela, but then after that, what happened, it was became tainted and corrupted, such that it required uh, renewal. And so when Prophet Muhammad came, he basically renewed. He, back to what Jesus said, this is what happened. He, he, he clarified the, the message of Tawheed or monotheism. These are the main differences between Christianity and Islam. Okay. Do you think violence is inherent to Islam? Violence is inherent to mankind, to humanity. And Islam provides a great deal of justification for the violent believer to invoke and to justify and to pretend that the violence he applies is righteous. Hmm. That's really interesting. Thank you. That's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Do the teachings of Islam encourage terrorism? Again, because violence is inherent to mankind, <laughs> the the individuals who want to seek power uh, find enough within the legacy of Islam to engage in terror and terrorism to achieve their desired goals. And so there's plenty in the Quran, plenty in the Hadith, and plenty in the actions of the Prophet Muhammad to give organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda permission moral permission to use various forms of violence, including terrorism. Is violence inherent to Islam? Right. So violence is inherent to the human condition. Vi violence is inherent to the human condition. It's inherent to human beings. We've seen it in history. And there's nothing... Uh, inherent about violence in Islam. In fact, violence is instrumental in the Islamic discourse. It's instrumental, i.e. it's a means to an end and not an end itself. Because if you look at the verses which re refer to violence, that its permission has been given to those who can fight in the, uh, in the way of God because they have been oppressed. It's couched in language of justification. If it's couched in the language of justification, that means that the original condition is not fighting. 
That is the original condition. That's not fighting. It's instrumental. It's a means to an end. Since violence is inherent to the human condition and history has told this story, then Islam, what it comes and does is it limits the human impotence, uh, impetus, the human impetus for belligerence, you see. How does it do it? It does. It limits the human impetus for belligerence by giving ways of or just war theory of itself. If you do have to fight, do not cut down trees, the Prophet told us. Do not kill women, he told us. It wasn't for her to be killed. Do not kill old people, he said. Do not kill uh, you know, uh, the, the monks. Do not go into these uh, places. In the Quran, it says that fighting happens so that, you know, uh, so that you know, be on salawatun yuth karufiha or masaj yuth karufiha smullah, that places of worship should not be harmed, and so on. These things are mentioned in the Quran. It only takes seconds to look at it. It's not. It's an open secret. Unfortunately, the Quranic discourse has been defamed and distorted, misappropriated, decontextually understood by academic charlatans like this miserable specimen who i will not mention because we know who we're talking about who has not who doesn't even know listen michaela she doesn't even know the difference between a verse of the quran and a hadith of the prophet as mentioned in one of her uh, books in i think uh, page number 77 in the book infidel or 301 actually in, in the book infidel she mentions that uh, that surah al Fatiha is a verse or something like this, or that the uh, there's a hadith and she mentions a hadith and she, she, she thinks it's the Quran. She doesn't even know what's the Quran and what's the hadith. If she doesn't know what's the Quran and the hadith, she doesn't even know how to differentiate between the book. An eight-year-old can do that. This individual, if we listen to people like this, who inspire terrorism, like with Anders Bervik, and who mentions her by name, then we will get a distorted understanding of what Islam says. Clearly, Islam is against certain types of violence. And when it does call for violence or allows violence, it does so in very restricted conditions. And it must be done so with the hierarchy and the state leader and all these kind of things. And if this is something that someone doesn't believe, all someone has to do is go to the centers of Islamic power, Azhar, uh, Medina University, Adil Band, and so on. These places, Nadwatul Ulama, these big universities, which are the equivalent of the Oxford and Cambridge of the Islamic world, which scholar believes in what she, this woman is saying, this, this miserable liar? No one believes in what this, this right-wing, far-right narrative from the Muslim world itself. It's only faction groups and uh, ridiculous people who have political uh, agendas. And that, unfortunately, is Islamic terrorists and also right-wing terrorist influences like Magan. Do you think democracy, democracy is uh, compatible? Like, is there a way? Oh, so I was in, um, I was in Dubai last year and Dubai has gotten, at least from my perspective, just having gotten there has gotten a lot less strict than it was. And you can go to some areas and you can see, oh, this is much more, I don't know if conservative is the right word to use, but it's just much different. And then there are areas where it's like, oh no, this is where tourists are. And now it's allowed to be more liberal. Um, do you think there's a way for Islam to adapt to the modern world? Well, first of all, what we're seeing is Muslims adapting to the modern world. Muslims are voting with their feet. They're coming to Europe. They're coming to America. They love the rule of law. They love freedom. They, they, they want to take the opportunity that uh, countries that are democracies provide. And in that sense, I would say Muslims are totally compatible with democracy because they desire it like all other human beings. The body of Sharia law or Islamic law is incompatible with democracy. The reason is because the principle of that body of law is that God is the lawgiver. And if God is the lawgiver, then a, believe, a Muslim believer, a believing Muslim has to try and, uh, and sink, if you will, <laughs> the thought that God is the lawgiver with a parliament or a Congress or, or people who are elected to take God's position. And so mm. that becomes 
very, very difficult. And that is why I think up to a point, organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and so on, they were having uh, an easy time recruiting people because they are saying what the Quran says is what we want. This is what the Prophet Muhammad did. You can't have a democracy in Islam because you are turning human beings into lawgivers. That's the greatest possible sin. Uh, hmm. uh, and so I think if you approach it from, you know, the, the perspective of the scriptural framework, then those two legal frameworks, Islamic Sharia law with the basic tenets of a democracy, that's incompatible. But Muslims, millions and millions of Muslims would love to live in a democracy. Okay, that makes sense. That's interesting because in, in Christianity, it says, um, I'm going to butcher this too, but respect authority, right? That's part of it. So if you have lawgivers or people in institutions or kings, it says that respect them, right? Right. Yeah. Interesting. But okay. I think because in Christianity, the separation is accepted. The church is not the lawgiver. The Pope is not the lawgiver. Jesus Christ is not seen as the lawgiver. And other, you know, Christian scholars and theologians were not seen as lawgivers. They may have adopted those positions. They may have assumed those positions, but the separation is very clear. And I think that was, that is probably why um, you know, democracies and republics emerged out of Christian culture and why it's a huge struggle for something like that to happen within Islamic culture. Okay. Is democracy compatible with Islam? So democracy is used by all those who use it, or I'll say all, maybe uh, I'll say with, for most of those who use it, instrumentally. A communist, a socialist who uses democracy to vote in a communist party does so because not because they want to see democracy enacted necessarily, but because they want to see communism enacted. So in the same or by the same token, those who use democracy from, let's say, the Muslim uh, sphere in Muslim countries to implement Sharia, they do so instrumentally as well, in the same way as someone would use it to put socialism or communism. So once again, there's nothing peculiar. There's nothing, it's unremarkable, the Islamic use of democracy compared to other ideologies. That's the first thing I'll say. The second thing I would say is, even Christians, for example, in America, they use democracy in this way. For example, conservative Christians. Sometimes there have been, as you know, referendums and other things for gay rights. Christians will, although they might not mention this, they will vote against uh, gay marriage, for example, or against abortion, for example, okay? And they'll do so using democracy. So they're trying to implement Christian values through democracy. In the same kind of way, Muslim people may use democracy to put the same kind of values in this case, you know, the family values or something like that. So yes, but however, what we don't believe in definitely is that the majority of people are speaking the objective truth at all times. I mean, just because the majority of people voted for something, it doesn't mean that thing is true. Plato made this, uh, this assessment of democracy a long time ago when he said that it's, it's not for the ignorant ones, like, you know, to, 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 to talk about things which they're not specialized in. Just because the majority of people think that the earth is flat, it doesn't mean that the earth is flat. And that was the status quo in the world's history before people thought the world was flat. So just because the majority of people say that, it doesn't mean that's the objective truth. So we would say the same thing. We believe the objective truth, the objective truth is that which the all-knowing, the all-wise says, which is in the Quran and the Sunnah, and we have evidences for that. We believe in that. We can prove that. Um, however, uh, democracy is used instrumentally. Uh, and if we're talking about in the Western world, then of course it, it's used in the same way. But in, in terms of the Muslim world, once again, it's, it's used instrumentally. It's compatible from that perspective, not from the perspective that we believe that whatever the majority say is an objective truth, uh, which is in any way com competitive with the Islamic discourse or the Quran or Sunnah. Absolutely not. Yeah. This is an important one. Okay. Um, and I, I suppose you've been working on this for a good portion of your life, but how do we bring peace for the future, given the fact there are, given the fact, Islam isn't going away. 
I mean, I, I understand the question. It is, you know, between how do we bring peace between Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, Jews, Christians, uh, atheists, agnostics, yeah. Muslims, yeah, who refuse to be Muslim anymore and who are threatened. How is that? I think, number one, uh, and I think it's really key and the most important point is to have honesty. I've seen a lot of exercise in what they call interfaith dialogue, where representatives of the various religions come together and try to figure out how we can coexist with one another peacefully. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons why I think these exercises fail is because there's a lot of beating about the bush, um, not putting on the table what the key differences are between these faiths and those who don't have faith. And I think once we get to the principles, then you can say, how can we get along and uh, have rules, um, have the enforcement of the rule of law. So if there are Muslim people coming to non-Muslim societies, they have to abide by the values, the norms, the laws of where they come. And those societies have to enforce those laws and norms and values. If they don't, then they're going to be faced with brute force. And I don't think that's a good starting point. But so far, we've seen these violent confrontations between Muslims and non-Muslims. And the way to resolve that, I think, is by strengthening constitutional democracies to enforce their laws and their norms. I think the fact that life mm. is changing for girls and women in Europe because there are immigrants from Muslim countries who make it, I think that should be unacceptable. Uh, terrorism, yes, we are free countries and we don't want to listen in on everyone's conversation. We don't want to become police and surveillance states. But I think it, 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 there has to be red lines making it very clear what it what is allowed and what's not allowed what's tolerated and what's not tolerated and then if that's enforced swiftly and clearly um, i think we will have peace until everybody comes around to thinking um that uh they want to live and let live. And when I say everyone, I'm talking about uh, Muslims in particular. Okay, so for, for some of these problems, do you think what would be helpful is identifying areas of Sharia law and just saying, okay, this is what it looks like where you came from and what you know, and then this is what it looks like here. And are you yeah. okay with the difference? That type of Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And, and to spell out that those aspects of Sharia that violate our constitutions, laws, and norms are unacceptable and they will not be tolerated. And that is an honest, forthright conversation. And so the individual Muslim can decide, well, in that case, maybe I don't want to go and live in Canada or in America or in Europe. Uh, maybe I just want to go back home because I want to be a good Muslim and abide by Sharia law. Uh, you give people choices when you make these, uh, you know, these laws and norms transparent. Yeah, and I suppose that's happening because, do you think that's happening because there are areas in the Western world that just aren't, that don't understand Sharia law, so they just don't understand the differences? I think, number one, there are, yes, there are a lot of places where people don't understand it. It's a different religion. It's alien. Uh, it's too time consuming to try and dig into it and try and understand what its origins are, what it means in practice and so on. And then I think there is a second group of leaders who think it's just a matter of time. You know what? Maybe now they believe in Sharia law and all that, but a few decades from now, everybody's mm -hmm. going to modernize and democratize. Let's just give them time. Now, that hasn't worked. I have seen that in Europe, and it looks like things actually, instead of uh, adaptation, uh, you know, from the third world to the first world, we're seeing the opposite trend 
where I'll give you the example of women again, girls and women in Europe are adapting to the reality of having to deal with, uh, you know, harassment, uh, sexual violence by adopting the same coping mechanisms, mechanisms that Muslim women in Muslim countries live by. You know, am I going to go out at this mm. hour? Am I going to go out of the house all by myself? Should I cover or should I not cover? All of these coping mechanisms have now made their way to Europe. And a lot of women live that way now. So that, that's really, that's things going the wrong way. That's backsliding. Okay, that totally makes sense too. That those, that that kind of, I guess that that aspect of the religion could spread if you're forcing women to stay safe by acting a certain way so that they're seen as less touchable, right? Basically. Right. But yeah, mm. basically that you as an individual woman, you make up your mind because you think I'm not, I, there's no point going to the police. I'm not going to be protected. There's no point in me taking the risk with my life and my own safety, because I know that I'm not, this isn't recognized as a problem yet. So these women are then making up personal decisions to change their lifestyles so that they're safe in the public space. I, I've talked to women who said, we don't, we stopped jogging. Uh, taking the bike, walking their kids in the park. Uh, there are women who, because they can afford, they've moved from one neighborhood to a different neighborhood. They're doing all of these lifestyle changes because the rule of law is not being enforced. They're not being protected from violence by their own societies. That is now backsliding. We're, get, we're going back in time to a place where women made choices to stay at home, to refrain from working or going out to the pub or going out to, you know, with their friends to sports, dances and so on because it wasn't safe for them to do. And now you're seeing this sort of thing coming back and we're tolerating it, we're accepting it. And I think that's wrong. It's terrible for women. Okay, well, those are my questions. That's a scary place to to leave, but those, those were my questions. Um, Ayan, thank you so much for coming on. And before you go, can you tell people where to find you, where to find your books? I'm going to link your books below too, and show notes for anybody who's interested in reading them. Well, my latest book is Pray, uh, Islam, Immigration, and the Erosion of the Rights of Women. And it's in bookstores, it's on Amazon, um, if you're interested in my views on Islam and whether it can be modified, reformed, I've written a book called Heretic. It's also on Amazon. Um, and then my life story, Infidel. Uh, and and, and that, that life story is really sort of the backdrop of how I come uh, to adopt the views uh, that I now have. Um, so, Michaela, thank you very, very much for having me on. And once again, I apologize for my tardiness. Oh, don't worry about it at all. That was great. Thank you so much. I'm just glad I got the opportunity to speak to you. So, so th th thanks again. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much. How do we bring peace to the future? So how, how do we either like coexist or get along with all these different, uh, different arguments and different religions that we have nowadays? Well, look, Michaela, the, the thing is, the first thing we need to do is we need to eliminate aspects of the discourse which are clearly insightful. I'm not saying through a, a culture of censoriousness uh, and uh, blocking free speech or anything. I'm not even mentioning that. I'm saying through academic rigor, through fact checking. So when someone like Ayn McGann mentions all the things that she mentions about Islam and she is not qualified, no one, when they, when they put her up, okay, uh, for, for interviews like these, says, let's vet you. Let's see what qualifications of Islam you have. Being an ex-Muslim is not a qualification of Islam. It's not a qualification of Islam. Just like being an ex-Christian is not a qualification. So the first thing we need to do is we need to take information from right people, for people that are actually vetted. I'm not saying 
that that has to be me. I'm not saying it has to be any Muslim. In fact, there are very many non-Muslim scholars of Islam, people like that are mentioned by Magan herself, Ayn Magan, which means refugee in the Somali language, to, to remind her of her humble beginnings. Um, that, and of course, it's ironic because she's now against refugees. Uh, that people like Karen Armstrong, that are scholars of Islam and have a completely different interpretation of Islam. So why is it the case that we are fixated on listening to the conspiratorial nonsense academics of people like Megan and having her on our shows? She has no background in the religion. She doesn't even know what's in the Quran and the Sunnah. So that's the first thing. We, what the first thing we need to do is eliminate nonsense people from the discourse, not through a culture of censoriousness and censoring, no, through academic fact-checking. And it is incumbent upon us, people like you and people like me, public figures, who's, who speak on these issues uh, to actually fact check these people, to, to vet these people. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, embarrassing to ask her to, to send her qualifications, her training. If you ask me for that, I'll send it to you. No problem. It has to be like that. The, the second thing is, the second thing is we need to realize it's not that Islam and Christianity are at war with each other right now. They're not. I mean, it's, it's, there's no crusade that's necessarily happening at the moment. If you look at the places where terrorism has happened the most, and if we define terrorism as state, uh, or sorry, an action which is done for politically or politically motivated action, the targeting of civilians, then we as Muslims condemn the terrorist actions. For example, the terrorist actions of Neg uh, Nag Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Dresden and Hamburg, and that which is happening to the Muslim people now in the Uyghur concentration camp. We condemn all those things, but it's also incumbent upon individuals from the Western discourse who sometimes can be apologists for such things to also condemn those things. And I say to you that it's important for us to realize that Islam and Christianity and Judaism has already coexisted histor historically and contemporaneously. In, in Spain, there was a convivencia. In, in much of the Ottoman Empire, there was coexistence. There was, why after the Alhambra, declaration in 1492 in Spain, did Jewish people migrate to the Ottoman Empire? They did so because they were being destroyed by Christians, killed by them, uh, forced, forcibly converted by them. These things are clarified in the historical record and consensually understood by every historian worth his salt. So we have to understand history to realize that it's not been a case of it's bleak and there's always been conflict. And I'm not saying also that it's always been uh, sunshine and rainbows, Michaela. I know there have been times, crusades, there have been other campaigns and so on, which has been negative. And what we're seeing now, the Iraq war, the so-called war on terror, terror and so on. These are negative aspects. But that's not all that's happened in 1,400 years of history. So knowing our history, number two. So number one, we said to eliminate individuals who are unqualified, ultra-crepidarians, academic charlatans, like McGann, the miserable specimen, from the discourse, not through censoriousness, but through fact-checking. Number two is to know the historical record quite well. Number three is to collect our sources from reputable sources and actually do the research. And finally, to realize that if you just travel, I, I honestly give this advice, go and travel, go to Ghana, go to Nigeria, this is a country with 50% Muslims and 50% Christian. Go to countries where there's a lot of Christians, a lot of Muslims, and you realize that people are already getting along. People are getting married. M Muslims and Christians are getting married easily. It's, it's, it's not something which is a taboo in many of the uh, world. Uh, you know, and so, so this is it's not a case of this didactic representation, this dualism, this binary that she's created, which is a fascistic remnant uh, of something that, uh, mostly Oswald or uh, even um, Adolf Hitler would say, we need to get rid of this kind of discourse because it is causing all kinds of problems. And we must recognize, and I must say this to you, it is a collectivist discourse, uh, funny enough. It's, it's a collectivist discourse. And already you've said, uh, everybody, in, you know, your father and, and uh, I and uh, McGann herself has condemned collectivism. It's a collectivism because you have an oppressor and you have the oppressed. Who is the oppressor? Oh, it's the Muslims. And who is the oppressor? It's a nonsense narrative, which we, we must realize is nonsense. And so these are the four steps. Number one, to eliminate nonsense from the discourse and education, to edify oneself. Number two, to read the historical record, to, to understand that both historically and contemporaneously that uh, Muslims have gotten along and that they can get along. Number three, to get your information from reputable sources, to vet people before you, if, if you want to ask about medicine, you'd go and ask someone who's qualified. And finally, to realize that this is something that's already happening and that we can continue 
uh, allowing to happen. And just look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad. He did not have this life. He had a life where it was clear there was a coexistence between Jewish people. He married a Jew himself. She was Jewish. Safiya bin Tuhayyeh. He, he lived a life which was a... Um, was clearly attempting to reconcile between people of different religions. And there's so many verses of the Quran to that effect. And anyone who tells you from this point onwards, anything other than what I've said is lying to you, Michaela. And all I can say is if you don't believe me, then do the research. Okay. That was quite an episode. Thank you very much for coming on. Welcome. If, if people um, want to follow you or want to find you online, where should they go? If you put Muhammad hijab on YouTube, that's all they have to do. Okay. Thanks again for coming on. Okay.